You might think that F1 cars would be built around monstrous engines, but the engines are smaller than those in many family cars, just 2.4 litres. The secret is precision, not brute force. And that precision is audible. It's the distinctive sound of components moving at speeds that would destroy an audible. To find out why, I've come to a typically sophisticated and glamorous F1 location with artillery expert Nick Hall. So this then is the point at which F1 technology and military artillery history come together. What do we need to make it good? It is important to have the fit between the projectile and the cylinder. And in the early history of artillery, because you couldn't bore a cylinder very accurately and you couldn't make an absolutely reliably spherical cannonball, there had to be a gap so that the cannonball wouldn't jam and so you lost power through that gap. A windage gap was a safety feature to ensure that a cannonball didn't get stuck in the barrel. But there was a price to pay. So this is the gap between the projectile, the cannonball, or in this case, the piston, and the cannon itself, the gap around the outside. Yeah, that, that is the windage. Well, I've got two projectiles here, two pistons. Now, we've got one is smaller than the other. One is a little bit smaller, there's a bit of a gap. Do you reckon that sufficient difference between the size on the projectiles make a difference in how they perform in the cannon? Yes, I do, because that, that gap expressed all the way around is allowing a lot of pressure to escape. So just that tiny difference will make a difference in what we see when they're fired out of the cannon. Yeah. So, first the smaller of the two, with the slight gap. This should affect the performance of the cannon slightly, but will make it safer. I've got the bigger one. Yeah. Okay. Which is probably just as well, as this is the first cannon I've built. OK, well, let's load it up, so, um, Just drop that in. Yeah. It's in, I'd say. Now, let's charge the cannon. My finely machined cannon stores air up to a pressure of 5 bar, or 72 pounds per square inch. Which, when released, will hopefully propel the projectile down our makeshift range. Right, our cannon is charged. Yeah? I'll go on zero. So I can run. Three, two, one, go. OK, if we're ready, in. Three, I've never fired a cannon. You fired a lot. Yeah. It's just, I'll just do it quickly. Three, two, one. Released by means of a high-tech lever and rope assembly, the pressure forces the piston along the cylinder and into the air. Well, it works, isn't it? That's very good, isn't well, it? Well, that's it. That's the smaller projectile. So what we must now do is go and mark the spot with my industrial golf flag. Look at it. A very respectable 48 metres on our first attempt. Right. Well, this isn't an exercise in demonstrating the effectiveness of my air cannon, but come on, it's pretty good. It's not bad at So all, that's the it? slightly undersized projectile mm. Mm. piston with a slight gap in it around the cylinder ball, which we the call windage. windage. This one is now a snugger fit. So if this were too big and you had to squeeze it, it would waste energy in overcoming the friction to shove it out of the barrel. Yes, but we've got very fine machining here, haven't we? Oh, only the best. OK, so let's put... Now, that is a... It is a closer fit. In fact, right, such a close yeah. fit, it may need just a little persuading. With our snugly fitting piston finally in place, the air pressure is built up to exactly the same five bar level as the previous attempt. There is no windage gap in this one, no safety gap. On my homemade high pressure cannon. Right. The cannon is charged. We've persuaded the projectile into the barrel. I'm going to yes. stand a bit further away now because I'm suddenly a bit more nervous. No windage on this one. No. If I go on three, two, one. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Okay, if we're ready. Three, two, one. <laughs> Whoa! Pretty convincing. Yeah, it's sounding more dramatic at this end, and that's clearly gone 
substantially further because of that tiny, tiny bit less of a gap around it. That's right. So exactly the same force fired it much further, and all because of a better fit. Three. Well, we know it went further than the previous attempt at 48 metres, but by how much? 11, 12. So this got an extra 12 metres. From 48. 25% so. increased range from just that tiny, tiny extra bit that closed the gap. Yeah. So you're not wasting that pressure and gaining range by better fit. But I really could not see the difference between the two. Barely, you could just about feel it with your fingers. Not, yeah, not much more than a, and a, this one a is thumbnail a, a thickness. And this one is 25% more efficient, effectively. It's the same charge, same power. Yeah. So that's more efficient by cutting down on that windage. Precision machining meant gunners didn't have to allow for windage, all thanks to one John Wilkinson, known in his day as... Iron Mad Wilkinson. In the late 18th century, he developed the cannon lathe to machine cannon barrels very accurately. And Wilkinson also realized his cannon lathe could make more powerful steam engines with precisely bored cylinders. The same principle makes F1 cars faster down the straits. So just that tiny difference, that tiny increase in size, made all the difference in this as a projectile out of my cannon. And if we think, if that were working as a piston in an engine, firing thousands of times a minute, it would make all the difference there as well. F1 engines are so finely tuned and the fit between the piston and cylinder is so tight that you can't even start the engine when cold. As Mike Gascoigne, an F1 technical director, explains. So this engine right now is stone cold. Yep. And therefore, inside those cylinders, the pistons are actually... Too tight. If right. you start it's this... attached. Yeah, if you start this now, it won't break, but it will wear and reduce its efficiency. So we have to plug in oil and water heaters, and we actually have them on timers overnight, um, such that they come on about three hours before we get in such that the engines are sitting there at operating temperature and then we can turn them over. So when you talk about tolerances, which is how finely, how closely things are engineered and made in terms of size, in this instance then, they're so tight that until they're at the right temperature... Yeah, they're hot home. They're actually fitted together when they're hot. So at the temperature they're going to be operating at, that's how they fit them together. And this is why these things end up sitting there looking there like they're on life support. Yep. With warm water being fed to them and warmed oil to get them to operating temperature. Exactly. 